every so often the internet decides that something is bad. Not just bad, the baddest thing ever. So bad that it's embarrassing. So bad that anyone who likes it is either insane, a bot, or most likely a paid shill. You spend enough time online and you start to recognise this as a pattern. People who normally wouldn't even care will end up having to have a take because taking a swing at the internet's punching bag for the day is an easy path to victory. I have a natural scepticism towards this trend whenever it happens. There's something about the ferocity and the conspiratorial thinking that comes along with it that really rubs me the wrong way. When people start saying that something isn't just bad, but bad on purpose specifically to anger people like them. However, I think this time they might be onto something. I think there is a kind of person that the Central Reboot was supposed to make angry. I just happen to enjoy it when those people are angry. Well, here we are. We've been to space. We've been to hell. We've even been to South Korea. And somehow we've arrived at the most controversial game in the entire series, the one with a black lady on the cover. You know, I just made a video about the trailer for the new Fable game, the one with the female protagonist so ugly she could possibly be a real woman. And I mentioned in that video that sometimes you just know, with no evidence whatsoever, that something is just going to cause an absolute meltdown. The trailer for this game was another one of those moments. Get the fuck away from my friends. I'm not trying to make broad sweeping claims about the people who dislike this game. I know there's plenty of perfectly well-adjusted folks who have their issues. I have my own issues. For example, I know that the game was a buggy mess at launch. But it's not a coincidence that every single time this happens, the same patterns emerge. It's always thumbnails that look like this and complaints about wokeness and feminism and the liberal agenda. Things were better when the industry wasn't run by snowflakes who hate the regular gamer like you. This cloud hangs over any genuine criticism of the game, because yeah, Saints Row 2022 has plenty of issues, and we'll talk about them, but how woke it is, is not one of them. The game's fine. It's got issues, but it's fine. It's not the worst game ever made. That might be shocking to hear, because the memified hatred this game has gotten has buried any kind of rational discussion about it. As soon as it becomes the standard opinion to hate something, all bets are off the table. I'd like to have a normal conversation about this game, but I feel like I can't do that. Even saying I think the game is fine means I have to defend my position because it's a fact that the game is bad and if I don't think the game is bad then obviously I've been paid off. I wish, frankly, someone please pay me. But I refuse to play this game. I refuse to engage in this level. There's no such thing as an objectively bad game and I don't need to defend this game from accusations of badness like it's a scientific hypothesis. Instead of assuming that the developers made a bunch of bad choices because they hate Saints Row and they hate you in particular and they want everything in your world to burn, let's instead ask why they actually made those decisions and gauge the success and failure of those decisions like reasonable adults, shall we? Let's talk about the Saints Row reboot. A game that is fine. Let's start with the most fundamental question. Why a reboot? Aside from the fact that Earth blew up at the end of Central 4. Reboots are not really in vogue right now. We're well into the era of flashy, big budget remakes like Resident Evil or Dead Space or Final Fantasy VII. Volition could have easily gone that route as well, putting together a modern remake of the original Saints Row, but they chose a reboot instead. Why? One reason is one that I laid out way back in my video about the original Saints Row. It's not a very good candidate for a remake. The game is dated in all the wrong ways when it comes to its cultural influences and especially the way it treats women. A modern remake would have to fundamentally change a lot of that and how much can you change before you're realistically just making a different game? Secondly, Saints Row isn't exactly the game that people think of when they think of Saints Row. The franchise's bizarre evolutions over the years means that Saints Row is more known as the wacky crime sim with lasers and aliens than it is known as the semi-series street gang violence game. While there's a subset of fans who'll continue to insist that this is the real Saints Row, being real doesn't actually matter to the marketing team. And Saints Row, the wacky crime sim, is much easier to sell to a new audience, which with a reboot or a remake is what you're trying to accomplish. Saints Row comes from a very, very different era of gaming all around. Even between the release of Saints Row 4 and the remake, a ton has changed. An entire console generation of evolution. The crime sim genre is kind of dead compared to where it was. As of writing, it's been a decade since the last GTA game. Crime simulators are starting to feel like kind of a dated genre. There have been other games adjacent, like the Watch Dogs franchise, but that series has leaned much heavier on a fight the power thing with classic outpost clearing Ubisoft content 
content. And then there's something like Cyberpunk, but that game was never sold as a crime simulator, it was sold as an RPG. Because GTA basically defined this genre, it also brought along a lot of expectations about this genre, primarily the reputation for being controversial and edgy. From the very first GTA game, they've included elements that were meant to be deliberately shocking, from Garanga to the part where you torture a guy in GTA V, or just everything about Trevor, really. And that kind of deliberate crassness is something that the first two central games especially inherited uncritically. As the games industry desperately tries to claw itself out of its edgy teen era, that kind of stuff just isn't desirable anymore. And as the bastion of that kind of game, the crime sim has been almost completely absent since GTA V. That may have been an overcorrection. They could have remade Saints Row, but tactically a reboot just makes more sense. You can ditch all of the baggage of hanging on to the increasingly convoluted continuity of the series while keeping the mechanical lineage. And without GTA in the mix, you have a chance to define what a modern crime simulator looks like. Does this genre still work without GTA's influence? Well, does it? Let's call the result a mixed success. Saints Row begins with a flash forward. The Saints are throwing a party at a refurbished church and a man with a briefcase of money is here to see the boss. After creating your character in a montage of partying things, cut to the character you just made being buried alive, reminiscing about their friends while they do so. The truth of this flash forward is much less interesting than this intro promises, but we'll get to that later. We cut to months earlier and some kind of recruitment video for a private security company called Marshall, and we meet the new boss who's watching the video on the way to their first assignment. After being shouted down by your SO, you're unleashed into your first actual gameplay with a scene that is completely symbolic of exactly what to expect from this game's combat. That was close. Ah! Ah! Oh! As I'm sure I've said a hundred times now, humour is one of the most subjective forms of art. A joke either lands for you, or it doesn't. And this one doesn't. I just personally have no care for slapstick. But the point of this gag is to establish immediately that we're throwing realism out of the window. If you can survive being pinballed between four different explosions, then you know that the combat isn't exactly going to be based on realism. Once you get past the pinball though, the reboot has one of the stronger openings in the series, charging through this old western town in search of someone called the Nawali. Marshall, like Stag, have advanced weaponry and technology, and the contrast between the dusty desert town and the white and blue Marshall uniforms is is quite striking. The intro also firmly establishes the new boss, and that's where we probably get our biggest departure from the previous games. In all of the previous games, the boss is an adult. In this game, the boss is a kid. Not literally, they're somewhere in their early 20s, but they feel so much younger than the boss of the previous games, and that's something you can either gel with or really, really not. Because along with that change, the entire vibe of the story changes. It's moved from a story about adults to a story about kids, with all that entails. The game, more than anything else, is about the power of friendship. The game primarily revolves around four characters. The boss, obviously, and your three roommates and best friends, Nina, Eli, and Kev. If aliens were the make or break point of Saints Row 4, the best friend squad here is the make or break point of the reboot. The main characters of this game have no interpersonal drama whatsoever. They're one of the most mutually supportive friend groups I've ever seen in any media. Like, even the V best friend squad had a falling out in season 4. They might rib each other sometimes, but fundamentally they are a completely cohesive unit from minute one of the game. It's sincere to the point of almost being parody. And look, I can't lie, I kind of love it. The party line is that the characters in this game are cringy, annoying, and badly written, but I just can't get on board with that. I love them. Yeah, there's definitely a couple of cringy jokes in there, but I've spent over a hundred hours playing this series, and trust me, I've seen worse. At the start of the game, each character is representative of one of the major factions in the game. Your own character is a recruit in Marshall, which gives you the clearest insight into that faction and also serves as an explanation as to why your character is so ridiculously good at killing people. Nina is a getaway driver for the local street gang Los Panteros. Kev is a DJ who hangs out with the Idols, a post-capitalist group of eccentric neon men. Mad Max types who want to burn the world down. And then Eli doesn't come from a faction, but instead serves as the brain and the heart of the group that keeps them together. Despite each being a member of an opposing faction, the game continually refuses to make that a point of conflict between the characters. They will always be loyal to this friend group first and anything else second. 
and when circumstances force each faction at each other's throats, they get caught in the middle and are forced to make that decision. Their motivations aren't anything so complicated like Julius trying to clean up the streets or the boss being an ambitious sociopath. They're just trying to pay rent. It's not until they're backed into a corner that they realise they'd be better off doing this whole organised crime thing on their own. Isn't that obvious? We're starting a criminal empire. What? Your car was right, Eli. About everything. Yeah, what the fuck is happening? Guys, we're really good at what we do. So why are we doing it for other people and not ourselves? I personally think this is genius. It goes back to the very core appeal of crime simulators. Like all games, there's an element of escapism, sure, but more importantly, they're about freedom. In the original Saints Row game, that was freedom from the law, freedom to do as you please, wherever you want. In the reboot, it's freedom from the system, it's an escape from the daily grind of living paycheck to paycheck, and that's an escape that resonates with me a lot more. The marketing subtitle, which I bet will one day become the actual subtitle for the game for branding purposes, is self-made, and it's a slogan that works on multiple levels. As a reboot, it's a signifier that the game is doing its own thing, it isn't going to rely much on the previous entries in the franchise. But it's also the fundamental structure of the story and the game mechanics. Everything you do in the game past the introduction, you do for you, but the dynamic is totally different from Saints Row 2. The boss of that game was motivated by greed and a lust for power. The boss in this game is motivated by ambition and mutual friendship. Is that a betrayal of Saints Row? Isn't Saints Row supposed to be a little bit more edgy than resorting to the power of friendship? That's kiddy shit. Sure, if you're looking exclusively at the first two games, but coming all the way through this series, this is a pretty natural evolution. I mean, Gag of Hell was about Johnny Gag going to hell to save his best friend. This isn't new material for the series. The original games used arcadiness and silliness to distinguish themselves from GTA's realism. Now we're using sincerity as a counter to GTA's cynicism. If you'd asked me, I would have told you that making a wholesome crime simulator is impossible, but honestly, I think they've pulled it off. It's a brush that's been applied to the whole game. You and your friends getting super into LARP with a bunch of weirdos dressed up in cardboard running around the desert isn't actually any more stupid than a gimp chariot race, but it is a hell of a lot less gross. The difference, I guess, is that one of these is cool and edgy and freaks out the normies, which means it's good, and one of these is lame nerd shit for dweebs, which I, a guy playing Saints Row, am certainly not. Well, I'm not too good for LARPing, and in fact, I think it's a clever meta joke because the entire game is a LARP. You're pretending to shoot people. These missions just make that joke obvious. If we're changing so much, you might start to wonder why we're even keeping the name Saints Row, besides brand recognition, obviously, and the answer is mechanical lineage. If you've played a Saints Row game before, then the reboot is a very natural evolution of the ideas that have been developing since the first game. While you might think the superpowers didn't make the cut, that's actually not true. They've just been reworked into something a little less superhero-y. The obvious one is that you start the game with a wingsuit that functions almost exactly like the gliding worked back in Saints Row 4. It's one of the fastest ways to get around the map, just instead of jumping, you slightly more realistically launch from wind towers in the tops of buildings. Leveling has been reworked and actually pulls some ideas from Agents of Mayhem, if you can believe it. As you level up, you'll unlock different combat abilities that can be mapped to your D-pads. These range from the basics, like throwing a grenade, to stuff that's basically just a superpower, like activating a vampire mod that means you leech health for damage done. There's also a series of unlockable perks tied to the challenge system that can give you a bunch of different buffs for specific situations, like faster reloads after getting a headshot. Weapons also have two paths for upgrades. There are flat upgrades that you buy with cash, but also every weapon has a weapon challenge, which, once completed, will unlock the gun's special ability, like adding incendiary rounds to an SMG or full auto to a pistol. The balance of combat remains similar to how it was in Central 4. Your health won't regenerate well in a fight, and the only way to get health back are the vampire ability I mentioned before, or by performing a flashy takedown move. This encourages you to stay close and aggressive with the enemies. From Saints Row the Third, the reboot borrows its faction variation idea. Each enemy faction in the game actually feels distinct, with many different types of enemies exclusive to each faction, and their balance of health and armour are distinct for each as well. The Idols are a swarm faction, where their health is generally quite low, but they attack you in larger numbers. And the bigger enemies have the ability to summon even more enemies into the field with a selfie. The Los Panteros are brawlers, most of them are armoured, requiring more hits to take down, and they're also very melee focused, meaning you want to try and keep 
keep some distance between them. Marshall, with their advanced tech, are heavy hitters, and opposite to Los Panteros, almost none of their units use melee. They're the most dangerous faction to fight, and they feel it mechanically too. There's old-fashioned police as well, who have the typical escalation you'd expect, first the beat cops, then the SWAT teams with riot shields, then the military. Another thing that we inherit from Saints Row 4 is that when you pick a big enough fight, eventually you'll trigger a boss fight, and killing the boss will wipe your notoriety. This time, each faction has their own boss with their own unique abilities. The game also inherits some of Agents of Mayhem's driving mechanics. The driving is much more arcadey than before, with cars having their own distinct health bar. You have a dedicated button for sideswiping, and in general, if you hit a car at full speed, it's likely going to blow up. None of this makes for a very realistic game, it's blatantly artificial, but it is a fun game that's well in keeping with the design that's been evolving throughout these games. While it never captures the chaos that the superpowers and bizarre guns brought to Central 4, it is a fair compromise that works for what this game is going for. Unfortunately, there is a downside to all of this, because this may be the first time in the series that the enemy factions are more interesting mechanically than they are as a story element. The game is all about the best friend squad, and easily the biggest sacrifice to that is the enemy factions. In all of the previous games, the gang leaders are some of the most interesting characters in the game, but in this one they couldn't be more basic mustache twirlers if they tried. The least interesting by far are Los Panteros, who are the most bare stock standard street gang that the series has ever delivered. We get some glimpses into their culture through Nina, they're heavily based around cars, and cars are a symbol of status and power to them, which is why their boss Sergio destroys Nina's car after she leaves the gang, but other than that, they are a street gang like any street gang ever. They're big, they're mean, they do crimes. That's Los Panteros. Sergio is just a big muscle-bound asshole with no redeeming character qualities or any character qualities really. The reboot never does the thing where we get cutscenes from the gang leader's perspective, so the only times we ever see the villains is when we're fighting them. The idols are theoretically the most interesting faction, and visually they're definitely the most distinct with their neon paint and weird dubstep helmets. They're some kind of anarchist cult that follow a faceless group called the Collective. They stand in direct ideological conflict with Marshall, a corporate conglomerate specifically named after a single guy. But the game only barely scratches the surface of that, because mostly what they do is typical street gang stuff with a slight hint of domestic terrorism. You can't really say that the game is trying to say anything about anarchism. The idols aren't fleshed out enough for that. In fact, you kill off the collective by accident in an unrelated mission. That's how unimportant they are to the story. Since the boss starts the game working for Marshall, they're the only faction that we actually catch a glimpse of from the inside. But what we see is exactly what you'd expect. Atticus Marshall is so cliché as a big evil corporate CEO that he literally has a moustache to twirl. It's kind of not even fair to call these factions villains, not like Kilbane or any of the previous faction leaders. It's more like they're just obstacles and annoyances on your way to becoming the kings of Santo Aliso. That's... Fine, it would have been better if these characters were fleshed out more, but they don't need to be. The story has shifted in a different direction. The drama isn't your rivalry with the Collective, it's saving Kevin, and that fits with the game's vibe well enough. Even the game's city takeover mechanics have shifted from being about tearing down these factions to building up your own businesses instead. Once you get set up in the church, you can go about setting up your criminal empire. The way this works is that you invest a significant amount of money into criminal ventures, and then these ventures will start generating income for you. These ventures also each come with their own activities to do, which is how the game reintegrates some of the side activities from the previous games. For example, setting up a shady medical clinic is how the game reintroduces insurance fraud, or getting into arms dealing is how the game reintroduces mayhem. On top of that, the game also has several side hustles, like bootlegging or escort, that aren't tied directly to to the gang but still bring in some extra cash. The requirements for these ventures vary massively in quality and fun factor. While some of them are classic activities, far too many of them are primarily focused around driving vans to various parts of the city, which is not what I'd call thrilling gameplay, even if the van has a big hot dog on the roof. Setting up all of these ventures is undeniably grindy in a way that feels much more prevalent than the previous games just because the map is so much bigger than any previous entry in the series. Santo Aliso and the surrounding desert land feels easily twice as big as Stillwater or Steelport, which is great, but when you're driving a truck of toxic waste from one corner to the other, you'll start to resent all that extra space. Santo Aliso is excellent though, it's a city with tons of character, which is exactly what a central game needs. It's more cohesive than Stillwater was, with districts that make more sense next to each other, but each district is way more distinct and interesting than Steelport ever was. 
in a bit of sarky design that I absolutely love. It's an inversion of the way open world cities are almost always designed. Instead of being built on an island, the city is built to circle a giant lake at the centre of the map. The city is somewhere in the middle of the desert in a fictional part of the US that's based somewhat on New Mexico with a clear melding of North and South American cultures. Driving around the lake will bring you through every different style of colour and architecture you could expect from a desert city. From the Vegas style bright lights and tacky casinos, to the rundown old parts of town, to the glamorous LA type mansions and golf courses, to the modern skyscrapers and towers of the city centre. The desert is littered with a different kind of tacky, the rundown roadside novelty of Route 66, and if you go deeper into the desert than the ruins of a different era, with these old wild west structures. The desert itself isn't even uniform like you may expect. On one side is the badlands, which are mostly sandy dunes, while on the other side is much more jagged and rocky with massive cliffs and canyons. It's impressive how much of a difference having hills on the horizon instead of an endless ocean makes to the overall feel of the game. Santo Aliso feels much more concrete than any previous city in the series. The local tagline for the city is Keep it strange, Santo Aliso, which might seem kind of tacky and like something a boardroom would come up with, but within the world that's actually the case. The whole keep it strange thing is clearly a kind of city council thing that they're trying to force, and that's highlighted by the audio tours you can find around the city, narrated by the most bored civic employee you've ever heard. Saints Row isn't the most visually impressive AAA game I've seen, it's definitely not pushing any graphical boundaries. In fact, it doesn't look nearly as good as Red Dead Redemption 2, which came out five years ago. But even if it's not pushing AAA fidelity, it's leaning into the Saints Row art style in a way that still looks nice enough to me. Not every game has to aim for total realism, especially not Saints Row. So after all of this, how exactly does the boss end up being buried alive? Well, let's talk about this guy. The Nawali is established in the opening as basically an older, more experienced version of the boss. He's got the same ridiculous combat prowess and the same love of pulling completely insane action movie nonsense. His name is actually really on the nose about this. Nawali is an Aztec word that roughly translates to shadow soul or animal twin. He's literally the boss's dark shadow. But a little later in the game, when you're preparing for a big train heist, you decide having some extra muscle in hand would be helpful, so you break him out of prison. Despite his rough exterior, the infectious positivity of the best friend squad starts to get to him, and after some team building, he's already become integrated as part of the friend group. He even saves the boss's life, sort of, by killing Sergio with absolutely zero difficulty. Sorry if I surprised you. I thought stealth would be our ally. Yeah, no, wow, you just killed him pretty hard. Eh, it was nothing. I know, I just kind of figured I'd be the one to... You know what? It's good. It's all good. The Nawali is, obviously, way cooler than the boss, which is why he's obviously the surprise final villain. The reveal of the flash forward isn't that your friends have betrayed you like it was leading you to believe, but instead that the Nawali has stabbed you in order to replace you and steal your life. Well, that's maybe not as dramatic as having your friends betray you. As we've established many times by now, this group sticks together. And now the final act of the game unfolds with you clawing out of your own grave and going on a rampage to find and rescue your friends from a total psychopath. Unlike every other villain in the game, the Nawali is actually established enough to be a compelling villain. He's already demonstrated that he's a match for the boss in terms of skill, and while his motivations are insane, they do make sense. I mean, who wouldn't want a friend group like this? You eventually find him in a bizarro recreation of your apartment where he's forcing the friend group to roleplay a quiet domestic life, and it's honestly extremely unsettling. But after freeing them and chasing him down, you end the game Old West style with a quick draw in front of the setting sun. This is not the story that I was expecting from Saints Row, but if you can pick up what this game is putting down, then how perfect is it that the villain of this crime sim that's all about the power of friendship is someone who literally wants to steal that friendship? That's so on the nose, I think it comes all the way around to being genius. The Nawali may be an insane weirdo, but he's a damn memorable insane weirdo, and I give props for that. It might seem insane when comparing Saints Row to its direct namesake that this is the story they went with, but after following the series through its 15 years of strangeness and evolution, insanity is exactly what I've come to expect. We live in an era of irony and detachment, without fail anything that's too sincere is marked as lame and cringy, and I am sick of that attitude. 
I want more sincerity, I want more positivity, especially in video games. And while we wait for GTA 6, another game about the folly of the American dream with people being screwed over by the system and probably a bunch of sex, drugs and murder, I'm glad that Saints Row decided to offer a different perspective. The Saints Row reboot is by no means some underrated masterpiece. The story's way too short and the side activities are way too grindy. But it's fine, and even great in some areas, and it certainly doesn't deserve to be remembered as the worst game of all time. It's clear this isn't what most people wanted from Central, although frankly given where this franchise has been, I don't think there's anything they could have done that would have satisfied everyone. I'm glad the reboot decided to be so much its own thing. It may not have been what everyone wanted, but I think in the end, it was something that I wanted, and I think history will be kinder to this game than it is now. Although, I can honestly say, I have no idea what the future holds for this game. Sure, they're adding some DLC with more to come, but after that, who knows? Nothing is off the table, and nothing would surprise me. The only thing I can guarantee is that it'll probably be really weird. I love you guys too. That's because we're fucking awesome. Hear, hear. You know, the Saints have only been around for like a minute, and we've already gained and defeated a nemesis. Not a bad start. No. Not bad at all. Thank you for watching, especially if you've been watching this series since the beginning, congratulations on making it to the end. And a very special thank you to my patrons for supporting the things I do. If you'd like to see your name up here or get access to exclusive Patreon videos, you can find that link in the description below, or you can wait a few seconds for a little box to show up on screen that you can click, because I'm at a thousand subscribers and I can do that now. If you want to go through my entire series of central critiques, you can find that playlist up here, or if you're looking for something completely different, why not check out this video about Star Trek's Changing Worlds, a really good show that's also terrible.